It is through self-denial that victory and freedom come. Self-denial is the essence of Christianity because it is the essence of Jesus Christ. This is who he is. It's not something he does. It's his humble, meek nature. There's a lot of things that Jesus could have done to exalt himself, but instead he denied himself. The number one illusion we're addressing is that this life is about me. That's the illusion. Life's about me. The the illusion that life is about me. You ever been to a birthday party where they bring out the birthday cake to the kid? That boy or girl's there like ready to blow out the candles and then some other kid who's got really wet lips, a lot of spittle, his not birthday it is, just decides to blow out the candles. I know, I am, man. As a parent, sometimes you're like, I may be violent right now. Like, what just happened? Get your dirty lips off my kid's cake. You ever been to a wedding where a woman who's not the bride wears a white dress? (gasps) You just don't do that. This is not about you, lady. Wear pink, purple. There's a whole bunch of other colors. You chose white. You ever come to a church service where instead of singing praises to Jesus, they quote the philo- philosophical poet laureate named Toby Keith, and they make the song, I want to talk about me. I want to talk about me. You remember this song? Do you remember this song? Yeah. That would just so out of place. But listen, that's what we're doing in the American Christian church where we're making the gospel centered on the person of us instead of on the person of Jesus Christ. This is the illusion that the central biblical theme is about me. This is not how we follow Jesus. This is not where abundant life is found. Let's listen to the words of Jesus. If you have a Bible, open it to Matthew chapter 16. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you one. Or you can click on the message notes link in the app, the church app there, and you can follow these along. We're in Matthew chapter 16 And uh, I just want to read this. Go ahead. Hold your hand up high if you need a Bible. They're coming to you. Praise the Lord. We ran out of Bibles a few weeks ago. That's a good thing. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. (laughs) The nerve, right? Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Ouch. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is where the illusion is rooted. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but the self-centered gospel concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is the key verse of this entire series. Let's read it again. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my soul. <laughs> nice. Toby Mac. Or what can anyone ga- give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. To be clear, Salvation is a gift of grace. You need not work or earn anything. There is nothing that you could produce that would make God love you anymore. However, there is a price to be paid for the reward of God that he speaks of here. Just before this scene that we're reading in, Jesus asked his disciple a setup question earlier in Matthew chapter 16. It's just a setup. He says to them, who do all the people say that I am? What are the crowds saying about me? Now, Jesus already knows the answer because he's Jesus and also he has ears. He's been around the crowds, right? So he's heard them say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah the prophet, some say a teacher, some say you're a man from God. They're saying all these things and Jesus is like, okay, good, 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 good. But then he asks them the question he really wants to ask them. He says, but what about you personally? Who do you say that I am? How do you relate to me? How do you define me? We need to answer that question nearly daily. 
Who is Jesus to me in this moment? Is he crutch? Is he gimmick? Is he distant uncle that I talk to only in trouble? Is he savior? Is he friend? Is he Lord? Is he, is he? Peter answers, maybe because it's Peter or maybe because no one else is saying it, but what everyone's been thinking and wondering about Jesus, Peter says, he says, you're the Messiah. Now to us, we've heard this word so many times, we don't understand the prominence of what it meant in that moment for somebody to look at another human being and say, we think you are Mashiach, the Hebrew word for Messiah. Mashiach meaning chosen one, anointed one, the promised deliverer of the Jews. We think it's you, Jesus. Peter says it. Jesus is like, you're right, Peter. My father in heaven revealed this to you. That's me. I am Mashiach. Correct. Ding, ding, ding. Gryffindor, 500 points. I don't know. Something's happening good here. And then he says this. Now, let me tell you what the son of man, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the chosen one, the deliverer must do. And he says, I have come to suffer, to be rejected, to be tortured, to be killed, and then raise again on the third day. Those who were standing around, we can assume were in unbelievable shock because they had hoped that Jesus was the national and political Messiah that they wanted. Jesus is like, hey, you want freedom? They're like, yeah. <laughs> you want oppression to cease? Yeah. You want to enter into this time of immorality or where morality is on the rise, get rid of immorality, like there's going to be holiness in the temple, and it's going to be, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> Mashiach, 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 right? And Jesus says, all right, here's the plan. Gather in. I'm going to walk into enemy territory. Allow them to arrest me, to ridicule, torture, and murder me by crucifixion. Crucifixion on three, crucifixion on three. One, two, three. Yeah. It's hard for us to fathom what's happening in the minds of the disciples, but imagine if one of our candidates for uh, for president at the end of their campaign said, hey, listen, when I get to Washington, D.C., I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tortured. And on one day, they're going to march me out onto the White House front lawn and execute me. And we begin to get a sense, a, a tiny sense of what the disciples are experiencing. Like, wait, wait, we thought you were going to D.C. to fix everything. Wait, wait, Jesus, we, we thought you were going... Jesus uses the word must. He says it twice. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer. I must be killed. Why? For Jesus, this isn't a plan or an idea or a prediction. For Jesus, this is a fulfillment of what was promised before the beginning of the world for our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, He, Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times, our times, the church age, for our sake. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, not good, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Before the Lord God said, Let there be light, Jesus had already committed to giving his life for the salvation of all humanity. The plan was in motion. This had always been the plan. And Jesus is saying, I will not deviate from this plan, though I've been tempted to. Satan tempted him when he was in the wilderness three times. Jesus denied that. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and his flesh is crying out like, man, this crucifixion is gonna be really bad. And Jesus says, Lord, if there's any other way to let this cup pass from me, but not my will be done, your will be done. And Peter <laughs> stands before Jesus and Jesus says, I'm gonna go be crucified. And he's like, not so, Jesus. Ain't it happening, not on my watch. We ain't gonna let that happen to you. 
This should never happen to you. You know what Peter's doing? He's putting himself at the center of the gospel instead of Jesus at the center. Jesus even calls that out. He says, you don't have in, in mind what God is concerned about. You have in mind what humans are concerned about. You put yourself in the middle of the story, Peter. Peter's worried about what happens if we lose you, Jesus. I've just followed you around, given my life to you, and you're going to be killed? And we're not going to be set free from Rome? And we're not going to rule and reign again in Israel? Not so, Jesus. He's at the center of the story. And so here they all are he, all hearing what Jesus has to say, that he's going to go and be crucified. This Messiah is going to turn himself over to be beaten and killed. And then Jesus says, oh, not just me, but you too. You as well. Like, oh, that's not great. Verse 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Just imagine the disciples like, wait a second, Jesus. We were under the illusion that you were going to march into Jerusalem as a warring hero. And you were going to crush our enemies and we were going to dance upon their heads. We already have the dance moves planned out. And what I think you said mistakenly is that instead you're going to go into Jerusalem and be executed. And then I think you also said mistakenly that we have to follow you in the same path. To deny ourselves, to take up our own crosses and follow you. And Jesus answers by his life in saying yes. If you want to truly be free, if you want to bring glory to the creator God, if you want to fulfill what your life was purposed for, then this is the plan. It's no illusion. I'm sorry, did you think that this was going to be easy? Did you think that there would not be any cost, any self-denial? Did you think that the story was about you? Be assured, this is no illusion, Illuminate Church. It is through self-denial that victory and freedom come. I put it in a sentence. Self-denial is the essence of Christianity because it is the essence of Jesus Christ. This is who he is. It's not something he does. It's his humble, meek nature. There's a lot of things that Jesus could have done to exalt himself, but instead he denied himself. Look at the very beginning. Jesus is in heaven. And before the world has begun, it is decided at some point you're going to leave the glory of heaven and be stuffed into an earth suit and crucified. He chose the way of self-denial. And he came. While on earth, Satan tempted him and said, hey, everything here could be yours. Just bow before me and it could all be yours. And Jesus chose self-denial. He said, no, I don't want everything. I just want the Father. Jesus could have stirred up an earthly army. Mashiach, 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 let's go kill him. With the swords, and the chariots ablaze, they could have charged into Jerusalem. He didn't choose that way. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane could have chosen to not have this cup of suffering placed upon him, but he chose self-denial. Jesus on the cross, the Bible says, could have called 10,000 angels to his side to smite all of his enemies. Shoo! What a scene. That would have been like, yeah. Right? But Jesus did not choose the way of self-exaltation or comfort. Jesus chose the way of self-denial and sacrifice at every turn. He said this out of his own mouth. I did not come to be served, but to serve. 